Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Insomnia by Stephen King. So I'm going to start by reading the blurb, and then I'm just going to go through and start looking at some of the tabs I've kept throughout this, and then at the end I'm going to give you my overall thoughts and my rating. So here's the blurb. You'll lose a lot of sleep. Ralph does. At first he starts waking up earlier, and earlier. Then the hallucinations start, the colours, shapes, and strange auras. Not to mention the bald doctors who always turn up at the scene of a death. That's when Ralph begins to lose a lot more than sleep. When he begins to understand why his hitherto mild-mannered friend, Ed, is getting out of control, dangerously so, and why his hometown is about to become the new Armageddon. An evil of unimaginable proportions has found a way in and Ralph has only one chance to beat it. The stakes are high, they always are when you're playing for human souls, with a joker in the pack, a bald one with a rusty scalpel. Very nice. So uh, first off we hear about, as we hear about his mild-mannered friend, Ed, and he's already kind of losing a bit at the start. But he says, it was absurd, of course. Ed was a research chemist. Ed was a member of the Book of the Month Club, the kind who took the £20 histories of the Crimean War they always seem to offer as alternatives to the main selection. And I just thought that was interesting because a lot of booktubers are uh, Book of the Month Club members. Uh, sadly, we, we don't have access to that over here in the UK. Then we have this quote at the start of part one by Iris Murdoch. There is a gulf fixed between those who can sleep and those who cannot. It is one of the great divisions of the human race. And I suffer pretty badly from, from insomnia, and so there were a lot of moments like that and quotes and little bits in this that I could really relate to, you know? So, for example, I thought this was interesting, and this sounds more like me because it takes me a long time to sleep. By late summer, Ralph had read enough about insomnia to know that the type with which he was afflicted, while not rare, was a lot less common than the usual slow sleep insomnia. People unaffected by insomnia are usually in first stage sleep 7 to 20 minutes after turning in. Slow sleepers, on the other hand, sometimes take as long as three hours to slip below the surface. And while normal sleepers begin to ramp down into third stage sleep, or some of the old books called theta sleep, Ralph had discovered, 45 minutes or so after drifting off, slow sleepers usually took an additional hour or two to get down there. And on many nights, they did not get all the way down at all. They awoke unrefreshed, sometimes with unfocused memories of unpleasant tangled dreams, more often with the mistaken impression that they had been awake all night. We have a moment where Ralph says that he's wool gathering, which I thought was interesting just because of uh, Charlie um, Charlie Heathcote here on BookTube. He does his wall gathering videos. And actually, he's recently started reading Stephen King as well. So maybe that's a sign he should read this, you know? We also have the Crimson King. Somebody says the Crimson King is coming here to Derry. And the Crimson King is obviously... Uh, like Randall Flagg, I believe, is this overarching Stephen King villain, and Derry is where it was set. We have a reference to Sunnyvale Sanitarium as well, which kind of freaked me out because the meat production factory, the factory farm in my current like ongoing work, is going through editing. That's called Sunnyvale. So it's possible I actually stole that from Stephen King by accident. So a character called Carolyn always used to say that getting old was getting a bad dessert at the end of a really fine meal. Which is, I think is a nice little simile for life. Alright, I've been cracking on with Insomnia and I'm going to highlight a few of more of my thoughts here. So uh, we have a character uh, called Wiser and his joke has always been like, My father was wise, but I'm wiser. Uh, and he's... Um, him and, him and Ralph are talking about sort of mental health and Wiser says, makes me think of a bumper sticker I saw a few years back. Support mental health or I'll kill you. And uh, Wiser is talking to Ralph because Ralph's suffering from this insomnia and he says, um, the only thing you owe me is a return visit so I can find out how it went. I'm concerned. There are doctors who won't prescribe anything for insomnia, you know. They like to say that no one has ever died from lack of sleep, but I'm here to tell you that's crap. People die from lack of sleep all the time, although the medical examiner usually ends up writing suicide on the cause of death line rather than insomnia. Insomnia and alcoholism have a lot in common, but the major thing is this. They're both diseases of the heart and mind, and when they're allowed to run their course, they usually gut the spirit long before they're able to destroy the body. So yeah, people do die from lack of sleep. This is a dangerous time for you, and you have to take care of yourself. If you start to feel really wonky, call Litchfield. Do you hear me? Don't stand on ceremony. But he doesn't really want to speak to Litchfield because Litchfield is the doctor that his wife had and his wife had cancer and it, Litchfield didn't diagnose it properly and so he's a bit hesitant, you know. And then uh, Ralphie gets involved in this, like, all these politics in this small town because this, this sort of high-profile woman is coming to 
Speak in defense of women's rights. There's basically a women's health center that as part of what it offers on top of things like counseling for battered women and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It also offers abortions and uh, this kind of women's rights advocates slash feminist is coming into town and then all these hicks are like staging a, a protest and Ralph kind of gets accidentally drawn into all of this and defending the women's rights advocates, I guess. And he, uh, he gets a knife in the stomach uh, because of it, so goes, uh, Mr. Roberts, Mike exclaimed, Christ, how bad are you hurt? I'm fine, it's him that's hurt, Ralph said. But he happened to look down at himself as he pointed at the man on the floor and saw he wasn't fine. His coat had pulled up when he pointed, and the left side of the plaid shirt beneath had gone a deep, sodden red in a teardrop shape that started just below the armpit and spread out from there. Shit, he said faintly, and sat down in his chair again. He bumped the horn-rimmed glasses with his elbow and they skittered almost all the way across the table. The mist of droplets on their lenses made them look like eyes which had been blinded by cataracts. And uh, you see, so I actually quite like this storyline of investigating, you know, the two sides of this argument, the pro-life and pro-choice or whatever it's called. And we've got Mike Hanlon knocking around, who I'm sure is a character who I've come across in other Stephen King books, but I can't, I can't remember. Uh... Because there are so many of the books, you need to like, I'm, I'm kind of living awe of people like Edward Lawn here on BookTube who's like read all of the books like four or five times and just know how they all interrelate. And I'm obviously still doing my first read through and doing it out of order to boot as well. We have a thing here that kind of dates it. Uh, Laydeck had turned into a driveway next to Ralph's building and parked behind a large Oldsmobile with blotches of rust on the trunk lid and a very old sticker, Dukakis 88 on the bumper. So... I know Dukakis was running against, I want to say, was it George H.W. Bush? He was running against, he was running in one of the presidential elections anyway. Uh, uh, um, and I only know that because of Donnie Darko, which is weird because there are vibes of this that remind me of Donnie Darko in terms of he's seeing auras and uh, the way the auras are described remind me of how they were shown in Donnie Darko, the movie, you know. I love this little bit here, this little insight into insomnia. Of one thing he was sure, the tracks were really there. He saw them, Rosalie smelled them, and that was all there was to it. Ralph had discovered a number of strange and interesting things during his six months of premature waking, and one of them was that a human being's capacity for self-deception seemed to be at its lowest ebb between three and six in the morning, and it was now... Ralph leaned forward so he could see the clock on the kitchen wall. Just past 3.30. Uh-huh. And, I mean, I have a lot of problems with insomnia as well, so a lot of these things I could relate to. And I think, by design, this book gets more and more mental as it goes on, till, by the end... Half the time, I honestly didn't really know what I was talking about, you know? I think this as well is a great kind of little spotlight on the way that sm sort of small town cops can act, really. So, uh, basically, the police... Ch I think it's the police chief. Uh, he, uh, he gets, like, assigned the case of protecting Susan Day, this women's rights activist, when she comes to town. So, uh, his uh, colleagues throw a party for him, and he says, Some of the fellows had a party for me Friday afternoon, complete with cake, ice cream, and presents. Laidecker rummaged in his desk and came up with a rubber band. He slipped it around the poster so it wouldn't spring open again, peeked one amused eye through it at Ralph, then tossed it into the wastebasket basket. I got a set of those days of the week's panties with the crotches snipped out, a can of strawberry scented vaginal douche, a packet of Friends of Life anti-abortion literature, said literature including a comic book called Denise's Unwanted Pregnancy, and that poster. We also get a lovely little reference to Agatha Christie, just a small throwaway one which I like, uh, and it, the sentences, and just in case that's not Agatha Christie enough for you, Steve says the storms are on. Uh, also, an interesting point to mention here is that, um, what's his name, Ralph, I believe he lived in a town called Mary Mead, and Miss Marple comes from St. Mary Mead, so I just thought there was a really interesting nod from uh, King to Christie. Two masters at the craft, if you ask me. And then this guy called Don, who's obviously with the anti-abortion lot, He's talking about uh, Bill Clinton, and he uh, says, Something else, too. That uppity wife of his. Woman's a lesbian, I can always tell. You know how? I look at their shoes. Shoes is like a secret code with them. They always wear those ones with the square toes, and... See you, Don. Ralph called back and beat a hasty retreat. And throughout, I think four or five times, I noticed uh, Ralph saying, like, Sorry, I was wool gathering, I guess. And every time, it just made me think of Charles Heathcote here on BookTube and his wool gathering videos. We have this little bit about, uh, this little nod to St. Mary Mead, so I'll just read this out. Uh, this is actually right at the start of part two, The Secret City, chapter 11. The Derry of the Old Crocs was not the only secret city existing quietly within the place Ralph Roberts had always thought of as home. 
As a boy growing up in Mary Mead, where the various old Cape housing developments stood today, Ralph had discovered there was, in addition to the dairy that belonged to the grown-ups, one that belonged strictly to the children. There was the abandoned hobo jungles near the railroad depot and Nybolt Street, where one could sometimes find tomato soup cans half full of mulligatawny stew and bottles with a swallow or two of beer left in them. There was the alley behind the Aladdin Theatre, where Bill Durham's cigarettes were smoked and black cat firecrackers sometimes set off. There was the big old elm which overhung the river, where scores of boys and girls had learned to dive. There were the hundreds, or perhaps it was closer to two hundred, tangled trails winding through the barrens, an overgrown valley which slashed through the centre of town like a badly healed scar. And I think that's cool as well, just because it gives you a nice little background on Derry, if you're interested in, de in Derry from, you know, it and the other Stephen King books that take place there. We get this little conversation going here as well. Uh, all right. So Peterson says, those sperms aren't the same as a baby. No, Faye asked. Then why ain't the Catholic Church selling rubbers at bingo games? Tell me that. That's just ignorant, Peterson said. And if you don't see. But it wasn't masturbation Onan was punished for, Dorrance said in his high, penetrating old man's voice. He was punished for refusing to impregnate his brother's widow so his brother's line could continue. There's a poem by Allen Ginsberg, I think. Shut up, you old fool, Peterson yelled, and then glowered at Faye Shapen. And if you don't see that there's a big difference between a man beating his meat and a woman flushing the baby, God putting her belly down the toilet, you're as big a fool as he is. Yes, the, the baby God put in her belly, yes. I also love, love, love this little exchange here between Ralph and Lois, who is someone he kind of teams up with because she's been having similar experiences and seeing these uh, auras and whatnot. She's been crying, so she says, I look horrible, applying Ralph's handkerchief vigorously. I'm a fright. No, ma'am, just a little smeary. Lois at last turned to face him. It clearly took a lot of effort with her rouge and eye makeup now mostly on Ralph's handkerchief. How bad am I? She breathed. Tell the truth, Ralph Roberts, or your eyes will cross. He bent forward and kissed one moist cheek. Only lovely, Lois. You'll have to save ethereal for another day, I guess. And I just thought that was great. I'm going to save that for next time. Uh, somebody asked me how they look. So yeah, then when uh, Ralph starts chatting to Lois, he discovers that she's having problems sleeping as well. And that's kind of where their alliance forms. It actually gets described later as a cartet. We also have a reference to Dr. Kevorkian, which I don't understand, but I'm pretty sure is a uh, Vonnegut reference. Because he has a book called Goodnight Dr. Kevorkian, I think. And then, because I've read Goodnight Doc Mr. Rosewater or something. I don't know. It's been a while. And uh, Ralph basically gets in this confrontation. He actually gets stabbed, but he's got this thing in his pocket he can use to defend himself. And um, he doesn't know how it got there. And so uh, we get this little bit. So he's talking to uh, Lois, I think. And uh, she says, having a man stick a knife in your ribs like that must have been horrible. Thank God that you had that spray can. Do you suppose old Dor sees the auras too? That something from that world told him to put the can in your pocket. Ralph gave a helpless shrug. What she was suggesting had crossed his mind, but once you got beyond it, the ground really started to slope away. Because if Dorrance had done that, it suggested that some entity, force or being, had known that Ralph would need help. Nor was that all. The force or being would also have had to know that A, Ralph would be going out on Sunday afternoon, that B, the weather, quite nice up until then, would turn nasty enough to require a jacket, and C, which jacket he would wear. You were talking, in other words, about something that could foretell the future. The idea that it had been noticed by such a force frankly scared the hell out of him. He recognised that in the case of the aerosol can, at least, the intervention had probably saved his life, but it still scared the hell out of him. And we, uh, I, I think a nice little detail that I liked as well was that because they can see the auras, different aur auras of different colours mean different things, and murder is blue. There's sort of a vampirism theme in that because they can see these auras and they can manipulate them, for example, Ralph can take energy from somebody else and it will kind of de-age him and even to the point that people notice that he's looking better. So it's almost a, a version of vampiricism. There's also some quite tragic things because, for, again, for example, there's this uh, support centre for the women and there's things happening there and there's also the hospital. And because they can read people's auras, they can also kind of see their minds. So they meet a young girl, for example, whose kid has got brain damage and they see that it was the father who did it. He shook the baby too hard. And then Ralph starts to think about this freedom of choice thing and, uh, you know, it gets referred to as simply what the, you call freedom of choice is part of what we call car, the great wheel of being. We get this little, because one of the things that King's really good at is his detail and uh, I think there's a little detail here, this poster in this paragraph that I'm going to read. 
The reception area was almost ostentatiously plain. The posters on the walls were mostly the sort foreign tourist agencies send out for the price of postage. The only exception was to the right of the receptionist's desk, a large black and white photo of a young woman in a maternity smock. She was sitting on a bar stool with a martini glass in one hand. When you're pregnant, you never drink alone, the copy beneath the photo read. There was no indication that in a room or rooms behind this pleasant, unremarkable business space, abortions were done on demand. Now here we have part three, the Crimson King, who is kind of the recurring villain in a lot of King's work. There's this line that's in here a few times as well, which I can kind of relate to, which each thing I do, I rush through so I can do something else, which is kind of how I live my life, and it's probably not the best way to do it. And then one of the characters dies as well, and it's kind of sad because she's escaped her abusive husband and gone to help this charity and then basically been murdered because of this anti-abortion group. And uh, it says, well, it says here, two women were propped against the wall below a large poster of Susan Day in jeans and a Western style shirt. Don't let him call you baby unless you want him to treat you like one, the poster advised. Both had been shot in the head at point blank range. Brains, ragged flaps of scalp and bits of bone were splattered across the flowered wallpaper and Susan Day's fancy stitched cowgirl boots. One, one of the women had been pregnant. The other had been Gretchen Tilbury. Old door, he has this great couple of lines of dialogue, which I, I think are probably true as well, but... Time goes faster when you're high, Old door said. He spoke solemnly, but his eyes twinkled. Just ask anyone drinking beer and listening to country music on Saturday night. And then uh, Dorrance, he also explains this, which ties back into the Dark Tower. We're all bound together by the purpose, Dorrance said abruptly. That's cartet, which means one made of many. The way that many rhymes make up a single poem. There's some great stuff in here for, like, the Dark Tower. Which is why you shouldn't read this until after you've read The Dark Tower, in my opinion. So when Ralph and Lois decide to get a little bit of revenge here, Ralph says, I was thinking that I want to bust that little bastard chops for him, Lois. Maybe we could teach him what it's like to be awake at night. What do you think? We get some J.R.R. Tolkien stuff as well, including the, um, the ring poem. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them, in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. Yeah, read this little paragraph, it's all quite good. And it was like climbing a sand dune too. You slid one step back for every two you managed to lunge forward. They had gone out to High Ridge and accomplished something, just what Ralph didn't know. But Dorrance had assured them it was true. According to him, they had fulfilled their task there. Now they had come here and taken Ed's token, but it still wasn't enough. And why? Because Carr was like a fish. Carr was like a sand dune. Carr was like a wheel that didn't want to stop, but only to roll on and on, crushing whatever might happen to be in its path. A wheel of many spokes. But most of all, perhaps Carr was like a ring. Like a wedding ring. One ring to rule them all, Lois. One ring to bind them. I like this. This sentence, I think, is great. It's just a, some of the stuff that King writes, I think, is just so realistic and so, like, well handled. So here, he saw his ear lying on the floor and picked it up. He turned it over in his small hands and looked at the strands of gristle trailing out from the backside. And we have a smell that's described as ambrosial. I think, it, actually, let me read this out. It says, uh... Ralph could smell roasting hot dogs as well, and after the fetid stench of Atropos's den, the smell was ambrosial. And like, ambrosia is like the nectar of the gods, like the ultimate food stuff, I guess. So maybe they were vegan hot dogs. I, li I like this description of a character. Uh, Mr. Dugan, head of the Dairy Trust's loan department, decked out in his customary three-piece suit and rimless glasses. As always, he looked to Ralph like the only man in the history of the world to be born without an asshole. And then we have some sort of further development here, and again, how this all relates back to the Dark Tower. Listen then, every now and again a man or woman comes along whose life will affect not just those about him or her, or even all those who live in the short time world, but those on many levels above and below the short time world. These people are the great ones, and their lives always serve the purpose. If they are taken too soon, everything changes. The scales cease to balance. Can you imagine, for instance, how different the world might be today if Hitler had drowned in the bathtub as a child? You may believe the world would be better for that, but I can tell you that the world would not exist at all if it had happened. Suppose Winston Churchill had died of food poisoning before he ever became Prime Minister. Suppose Augustus Caesar had been born dead, strangled on his own umbilicus. Yet the person we want you to save is of far greater importance than any of these. And so Ralph says, one life means so much then. Yes, if the child dies, the tower of all existence will fall, and the, con and the consequences of such a fall are beyond your comprehension, and beyond ours as well. So they're talking, if this child dies, the Dark Tower will fall. Which is, yeah, like the end of existence. So, not good. High stakes. So I thought this was interesting where, basically, there's there's an attack at the end that's like a, an aeroplane being crashed into a group of people. 
and it's kind of prophetic of the World Trade Center. But King's done this elsewhere, like in uh, Mr. Mercedes. The plot lines in that reminded me of the Manchester Arena bombings here in the UK, and uh, like some of the attacks on like Lee Rigby and stuff which happened after King wrote it. So it just shows that he's very good at predicting what happens out there in the real world, what evil people are up to. But we have the bad guy here. He's, got a, he's flying this plane and it says, Taped over the altimeter, Taped over the altimeter was a small collar photograph that stopped his breath. It was Helen looking impossibly happy and impossibly beautiful. Cradled in her arms was the exalted and revered baby, fast asleep and no more than four months old. He wants them to be the last thing he sees in this world, Ralph thought. He's been turned into a monster, but I guess even monsters don't forget how to love. Which I think is good. I mean, King tends to do quite well at having bad guys that are three-dimensional, you know? Alright, then we get this song which you may recognise. One pill makes you bigger, one pill makes you small, and the ones that mother gives you don't do anything at all. Is it one pill makes you larger? And I think he does, does this twice. He like, uses those lyrics twice and got them wrong both times. We have another reference here that Charles Heathcote would like. Ralph, stop wool gathering. Look at your mother when she's talking to you. 70 years old and you still act like you were 16 with a bad case of pecker rash. And then we have this very cool reference here. Uh, so it says, Standing off to one side was a man dressed in faded blue jeans. A pair of gun belts crossed his flat middle. A holster hung below each hip. At the very top of the tower, a man in a red robe was looking down at the gunfighter with an expression of mingled hate and fear. His hands, which were curled over the parapet, also appeared to be red. Who's that? She asked, tapping the tiny figure, peering jealously down from the top of the Dark Tower. Him's the Red King, Patrick said. Oh, the Red King, I see. And who's this man with the guns? As he opened his mouth to answer, Roberta Harper, the woman at the podium, lifted her left arm. There was a black mourning band on it. Toward the woman sitting behind her. My friends, Miss Susan Day, she cried. And Patrick Danville's answer to his mother's second question was lost in the rising storm of applause. Him's name is Roland, Mama. I dream about him sometimes. Him's a king, too. Him's a gunslinger. So again, that's probably one of the most important tie-ins back to the Dark Tower books really here. And we have a guy here, I just, it just amused amuse me. He was running from all this devastation and he goes, God damn right to lifers, fucking self-righteous turds, I'd like to kill them all. So we have this epilogue, Winding the Death Watch, when Ralph starts to basically have his insomnia again. And uh, basically, it's quite a cliche ending really, but it does the job for what the story is. But uh, basically, just at the end, Ralph's thinking, uh, it's, it's all happening too fast. Everything is happening much too fast. Uh, life is a wheel. And it occurred to him that this was not the first time the idea had occurred to him. And that's because, you know, the wheel of car. And then the final, final bit, which I'm going to read out, is the very, like, the ending of it, which I thought was beautiful. Uh, basically, R Ralph uh, has been hit by a car and he's, he's no more. Lois looked up suddenly, her eyes wide and surprised, her grief forgotten as a gorgeous feeling of light, blue light, calmness and peace filled her. For a moment, Harris Avenue was gone. She was in a dark place filled with the sweet smells of hay and cows, a dark place that was split by a hundred brilliant seams of light. She never forgot the fierce joy that leaped up in her at that moment, nor the sure sense that she was seeing a representation of a universe that Ralph wanted her to see, a universe where there was dazzling light behind the darkness. Couldn't she see it through the cracks? Can you ever forgive me? Pete was sobbing. Oh my god, can you ever forgive me? Oh yes, I think so, Lois said calmly. She passed her hand down Ralph's face, closing his eyes, and then held his head in her lap and waited for the police to come. To Lois, Ralph looked as if he had gone to sleep, and she saw the long white scar on his right forearm was gone. So yeah, I thought it was, was alright. I mean, for me, this isn't a book you should read if you're new to King. This is a book you should read at least after reading all of the Dark Tower books because then you're just going to get more from it. There were some kind of pacing issues with it. It wasn't like as slow as I found Bag of Bones to be. And uh, also because it was set in May, uh, Derry, Maine, even with like the slower bits, at least the world building was building the world of Derry, which I'm interested in because it features in his other books. So there's a lot to love here in terms of like the intertextuality in the Stephen King uh, universe, but as a, like a standalone novel, it was it was slower than it needed to be, but it investigates some good ideas, I guess. I gave it a 3.25 out of 5. So there we have it. That's what I thought of Insomnia. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.